Well, well, well. Okay. Everyone, uh, getting set up here. Let's try this. Okay. All right. How's everyone doing? We're doing well. Working on that homework. Yeah, there's a bit of there's a bit of stuff going on in the world. That could be difficult. Um, understandable. Uh, so, um, yeah, I've been uh, I've been doing a little bit of research with my 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 old friend from grad school decided he wanted to do like some kind of um some kind of project on on this uh covet thing so we've been collecting a lot of data uh it's pretty interesting i don't know if anything will come out of it i mean we're, we're i think partially we're just kind of keeping ourselves sane and making it seem like we have some control over the situation by studying it um but they have this uh data on um from cell phones from this company called safe graph which basically just like tracks a bunch of people's cell phones i don't know how they do it i think i think they like pay the people or they get them to, to download some app uh but it like tracks where people go and so you can see what you know for particular stores how, how often people are going and you can and then you can look like over time to see how that that's decreasing you know massively um but the but but you can see it at a really fine level, so you can see it across all you know across the whole U.S. Uh, for different states with different levels of um, infection rates and things like that, uh, or different sort of beliefs about the severity of the uh, the situation. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting to see how people kind of kind of respond. Um, yeah, so you can. Go for it. No, go ask your question. Yeah, I mean, there's like, I mean, it seems seemingly everything is happening like through Twitter now, but you're like, that was sort of true before, but it's even more true now. So it's like, there's like five different papers, like specifically looking at, you know, how does the coronavirus uh social so there's a social distancing metric that safe graph puts out about how how often people go outside and uh there's like five different papers looking at how does that vary with the 2016 trump vote share and things like that by on a county level so i mean it's it's like it's already happening so yeah within the next year or two i'd imagine yeah but also i think part of it is um you know i think some some people are just kind of putting stuff out and like maybe it'll turn into something maybe it won't you know uh but but yeah there already is a lot of activity and it's sort of like there's also a lot of like uh duplication i don't think it's bad actually to have this duplication where people are like you know you're working on something and then it turns out that like two other people were working on that and like, okay i guess i need to do something else now um but also it's like it's good to know that if, pe if people are getting the same answers in, in parallel you know so that that's actually i think a good thing um but it's kind of related to to some of the stuff that we talk about here in terms of the production function for ideas. You know, it's like if you put more and more research effort into a single idea, you're going to get a bunch of people potentially doing the same thing and not realizing it. You know, um, and it's like stepping on each other's toes. So uh, it, it it kind of relates back to some of the the notions that we have here for the production function for ideas. But um, yeah, so I th I think there will be. I mean, it's gonna it's a big change in society, and it's much like the 
the financial crisis um sort of like you know you need to sort of rethink some things um or at least change the weight that you put on the probability of certain outcomes and the importance of certain outcomes um for one and so it changes how you think about policy and everything like that uh but also um yeah i mean yeah so it did yeah i mean it changed it changes the the way you think about the world but also it changes like how it changes the the focus of you know there's going to be potentially more stuff on health and also maybe there'll be more stuff even more stuff on climate although that's already true to some extent now um and things like that so no i i, th I think it'll be yeah i think we'll see that um yeah, I mean, so so we're, we're the the thing what we're looking at is actually like in terms of uh, for the, on the epidemiological side, there's these SIR models or SEIR, which is basically there, there's stuff that we could do actually. We, I mean, we we're like they're, they're they're differential equation models, so they're pretty similar to what we do here in in continuous time macro. But it's basically you have state variables. You got three for the SIR model. You got three state variables. Um, susceptible meaning you don't have the disease but you could you haven't gotten it before and you don't have Im immunity uh infected which means you have it currently and then recovered which means you had it and you've now recovered and so it's like you've got three state variables you know susceptible turns into infected at a rate at a rate proportional to the number of susceptible people and the number of infected people because you need that interaction and then infected people you know stochastically turn into recovered obviously sometimes they die so there's also that but that's relatively low in, in the grand scheme of things in terms of numbers um hopefully uh and then yep yeah, and that that's sort of how it goes and you can just kind of run the model um so it's like the standard epidemiological model so it, it's actually something you know, it looks in some ways similar to what we do here but with different state variables different labels and things like that so um but but yeah so we're what we're looking at is i mean we're just kind of messing around with it is is if you add in a an economic component to that um you know basically if you think about uh have you guys done search models at all in did you do it with danny or no at the end okay so yeah you can kind of think about it like a search model you know for a search model you've got workers that go out and look for a job and you've got firms that go out and look for workers and then the the the, the numbers on each side determine some matching rate basically so here it's a different story you've got people they go out, they're not looking to get the disease, but they need to go out to do stuff. Uh, we've got potentially infected people or people that are infected but don't know it, especially um, going out. And they're, again, they're not looking to give the disease to someone. They're just trying to get on with their day and get something done. But you said that same, you have like a matching rate notion, right, which is the infection rate. And that's going to be, uh, it's going to be sensitive to the number of um, susceptible people and the number of infected people that are going out, right? So, um, so it actually kind of can can look like a search model um and so uh and so there what we think about is like you know you wake up one day and you have some random you're you're uninfected but susceptible and you have some random need you need to go to the grocery store you need to get stuff from home depot i don't know uh or, or you do you have to you have a job and you have to go out and, and do your job um so you have some random need which is drawn from a distribution and so that's your benefit and then your cost is like well i know that i estimate that the prevalence of the disease is like you know 0.1 percent of the population and so that's like you know if i encounter them that i have a certain probability of of contracting the disease and so on and so on and so you um that's your cost right your expected your expected cost right is the the, the probability of catching a disease which is a function of the the prevalence of the disease so if your your draw let's call it z of your like need to go to the supermarket is um relatively high higher than your expected cost then you'll go out anyway and if it's lower then you'll say okay well i'll just stay inside okay so then that gives you if you take like the the cdf of that threshold that gives you a threshold right for for how urgent the thing you, you needs to be to go outside and that gives if you run that through the cdf that gives or one minus the cdf that gives you the pro the fraction of people that go out okay it also gives you kind of like some estimate of economic output if you take the expectation over that, like the the, the activity that people aren't doing. You think of it as a loss of output. Um, so you get like this endogenous response of people, right? They decide that they're going to go out less, right? Which of course makes sense, um, and that reduces economic activity. Um, and so, uh, 
yeah, so it's kind of cool. You can you can work in like a pretty simple like search style model. It's it's, it's even simpler than most search models. I mean, it's very 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 simple. In fact, um, are you just choosing this and you have some random outcome? Um, yeah, and it, I mean it's cool because if you look at this social distancing data from SafeGraph, you can see that uh, there are policies for these lockdowns. Okay, so like here in in PA, we uh, I think it was a twenty fourth or something. I, no, no, in PA we had like or like end of March we had some general lockdown, right? Uh, but then Allegheny County had a lockdown on like the 24th or something earlier than that. So you see like different states and, and counties and municipalities doing different sorts of policies at different times. Um, but then also you see, if you look at the just pure cell phone um, social distancing data, people respond well before, uh, in many cases, the policy is enacted. So if you look at Pittsburgh, for instance, according to this data, they respond around the same time that New York does. Okay. But at that time, New York was was well into uh the crisis whereas pittsburgh was like probably at least a week behind or two you know so uh but they still responded basically in the same way because they're seeing that in in uh in that place and so there's a question of like why do they respond when they see it in new york but they don't respond when they see it in italy or china i guess it's just proximity or, or familiarity or something i don't know um but but you see like people respond endogenously kind of before the policy happens and the policy will affect things too but it's it's you know so so that also gets into one of those big you know not just macro but anything really any econ policy question of like you know endogeneity of policy right so it's like oh we you know if, if you look at if you just look at places that are putting in lockdowns it's like well those are places that have probably a worse outbreak and people are already responding endogenously and so it's very difficult to actually see the effect of a lockdown and in, in addition to that right so so it's you know it, it you know it, it i guess what i want to say is like it's kind of interesting and also it's sort of like stuff that we are prepared to look at and i'm not saying we should do epidemiological epidemiological studies in and of themselves but like on the economic side it's stuff that we can we can think about uh with existing tools and minor tweaks uh and combinations with other models right so um yeah uh so yeah, so that's I, I thought it was I thought it was interesting. Um, maybe maybe we can I don't know maybe we can look at it later. We're running out of time here in the in the class, so I don't know what we'll get to. Okay, but but maybe we can think about that later. Uh, okay, so um, let me. I should go in there. So we got everyone. It seems like we got a lot of people here. Good. Uh, so um, any questions on the homework? So far, uh, we doing well there. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna take silence as as a as an enthusiastic. We're doing well uh, on the homework. Um, so that's good. That's good. Um, if you if you have if any pops up in your mind, uh, just let me know. Okay. So um, all right. So then I guess we're gonna continue on here. Um, some stuff. So one thing is uh, the final. You got. I, I presume you all got the email. I, you know, I, for some reason I put down the twenty second. That's when Richard's micro final is. But we had an email, which clearly said that I was the twentieth, and then I just read the email wrong. So uh, I'm on the twentieth. Macro me, Doug. I'm on the twentieth. We're on the twentieth. That's when we'll do the exam, and then the twenty second, I believe, will be Richard. Although, of course, treat his word as as the final word there. But I believe that's the case. Um, we're going to decide on Friday, basically exactly how we're going to structure the exams. Okay. Like the time allotment and, and everything like that. So, um, if you, uh, one bit of useful information, at least for me, and I presume everyone would be like, what time zone are you in? Okay. Because that, that can, that can obviously be an important factor if we just, put the exam at a certain time, Eastern Standard Time. If you're in China or really anywhere in Asia, then that's gonna be in the middle of the night. So uh, presumably so, um, we wanna try and kind of be sensitive to that, okay? So one thing we can do is just have different times. Another thing we can do is just make it a, a relatively long window that you can work on the exam and then that you can work when, whenever you, you feel like it, okay? So that's the basic idea, um, but, but we're gonna decide for sure this week and the, at the end of this week and then, and then we'll let you know. Okay, so um, yeah, 
that's that's it on the exam. I updated the syllabus on the website to reflect the fact that my exam is on the on the twentieth. Okay, on Monday, so uh, that should be good. Um, got that link for my YouTube channel. If you want to go back, see the old classics. Uh, that's there. There's like a playlist for like all my classes are on that channel, but the play there's a playlist for our for each class individually. That's what I link to. Um, yep, that's pretty much it. Okay, so uh, let's let's move on to some some new stuff. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna branch out a little bit, not too much, but a little bit, um, and do some stuff that's sort of what I would call to generally useful continuous time stuff. Um, it's uh, so so. I guess we haven't, I believe everything we've done in terms of optimization kind of stuff, and we've all done, we've, everything's been in continuous time and that's co going to continue to be true. Uh, uh, but we've done a lot of Hamiltonian kind of stuff. Um, whereas I don't believe we've done too much value function, proper value function stuff. So we've done the value of like a firm kind of the V and V dot stuff. Uh, but that's, that's very, there's no state variable there. Right, there's no um, there's no notion of a state variable. It's just like you're a firm, and you do your thing for a while, and then you get booted out or something, right? So that's like technically a value function, but but it's not super interesting in that sense. Okay, so um, now, but then you, you you probably have been doing value functions in discrete time uh, in Danny's class, right? So with like capital and stuff. So so I just want to sort of show you the ropes on working with uh, value functions with state variables. Uh, uh, in continuous time, so we can do that kind of a simple, just go back to do like a neoclassical growth model kind of thing, uh, just to, to see how it works. And then, you know, you could do a bunch of other stuff. You could do a firm problem where, uh, the, the, the productivity of a firm is changing in some way. Okay. Maybe the, if you think about our endogenous growth models we've done so far, it's always, that the firm just kind of gets their product and, and like sits around and, and milks it until it, it, it goes away, right? So, um, but it might be, and it is the case that firms do try and improve their own products. And actually that's probably the most important thing that they do in some sense. Um, they improve their own products. Uh, and that's gonna be something more like looking like a value function where it's like, you got a certain productivity today, you do some research, you improve your product and then it gets better. And then that continues on over time. So that that's something that we, we could then look at with the, the sort of value function setup, okay? Um, so you can do that. We can do sort of you know, kind of firm style stuff, uh, and then we can also add in stochastic elements. Okay, so we haven't we haven't really talked about that. We talked a little bit about stochastic stuff, right? So we talked about the create you know the creative destruction shock. I guess would be the big one where it's you know you're going along and then boom at some point you 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 get booted out. So that's but that's very. For, you know, it's a Poisson process, so it's got that simple form. Uh, it's it's discrete. It happens at like a discrete time, and it only happens once. And once it happens, you you have zero value forever. So it's a, it's like a it's a very diagonalized system. Okay, so um, we can we can look at more interesting and complicated types of, of stochastic things like stochastic processes, uh, Wiener processes, like a kind of a what's called Brownian motion, kind of random walk stuff. Okay, so uh, that that's kind of the the, the roadmap there. Okay, so we're gonna do like stochastic, you know, continuous time stochastic value functions. Okay. Um, all right, so so let's do that. Um, let me bring my notes here. Okay, so uh, all right, so so yeah, so we're gonna start with this um, neoclassical growth model. All right. Now, let me get my notation here. So we're going to use, all right, so we're doing continuous time. All right, so I don't know. My handwriting always starts out really bad and gets slightly less bad uh, over the course of a lecture. Um, functions. OK, so um, we're going to call, let's call it, you know, we're going to call it v. That's what we always call it, all right? And then let's say our state variable for now, because we're doing uh, kind of neoclassical growth, it's gonna be K, all right? So uh, first, let's um, do the whole kind of discrete limit thing, okay? Um, so if we if we just think about 
well, what's our, what's sort of our discrete analog? Okay, so what, what if we were to do this in in just a, a purely you know one time step at a time discrete setting? Okay, then uh, so usually uh, you do the thing where you're like choosing k prime and then uh, that, that's your continuation value and then you have some consumption and stuff like that. I'm gonna do a little bit different. I'm gonna have investment. Okay which is just a reparameterization. Instead of choosing K prime, we're gonna choose the investment rate and, and do things in terms of that. So here that would be like, uh, okay, so we're gonna, this is gonna be a maximization, max over I of a whole thing. And that whole thing is gonna be, well, your utility. That's true. Let's do this there. Now you can see it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I need to, I have them, um, they're not like, uh, on the website right now. I'm going to, I'm going to push these to the website after class or like tonight, realistically. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so this is going to be your, your output minus investment. That's your consumption, right? That goes into utility. Uh, and then you've got, let's see. So now, you know, like our discount rate, we'll call it beta because we're in discrete time. We'll, we'll change that to row uh in a minute okay um we'll have a row analog there uh okay and so that is going to be v uh what so it's gonna be like one minus delta k plus i all right so that's your that's your k prime okay same as choosing k prime but we're just reformulating in terms of i so this is like a standard kind of neoclassical growth sort of thing okay so now if we want to do um if we want to do like this discretized version and take the limit as the time step goes to zero, we got to throw in some deltas. Okay. So we're doing like uh, delta time step. Okay. Um, and so if we do that, okay, so we're going to be of K, same thing. Still maxing over I. Okay. Now we're going to have, you know, delta times whatever flow utility you're getting, which is going to look the same as before. Okay. F of K minus I. Um, plus, okay, so now you're, we're going to do discounting a little different. So we're going to do, you know, what the one minus delta times rho construction. Okay, that's the the continuous time version. Uh, and then we're going to do this thing. So v. So what's happening here? So so here, um, the so how do how do we do uh, how do we do depreciation? Okay, so depreciation is going to look like it's actually going to look like um, discounting. It's going to look the same, basically, because depreciation is you have a proportional decay. Okay, you know, k well, absent investment, k dot is minus delta times k. All right, which means that the growth rate is minus delta. Okay, so it's like an exponential decay. If the growth rate is minus delta, it's decaying exponentially at rate delta. So uh, you you have that same approximation to an exponential here, which would be like one minus delta times delta okay this is capital delta this is lowercase uh that's times k all right and then you have um investment okay uh which is going to look like this delta times i right so you, you kind of you need to to note things as is it kind of like units right so you have i as a flow investment so that's got to be multiplied that's a that's like something per second so you need to multi multiply that by a time to get an actual change in the state variable. Okay, same thing here. All right, so that's that's what this looks like. So we threw in the deltas in the appropriate place. Okay. Um, all right, and so now it's just a matter of uh, subtracting things and dividing things and. and Yeah, yeah. So it's like you know, if you think about, um, so just just think about like you know, k where, where you only had depreciation, then k dot would be minus delta k, uh, and so you know, k k of t is e to the minus delta k, which is approximately equal to, uh, well, sorry, it's k dot k dot of t like this, okay. And that means that, um, what does that mean? That means that, that like 
you know, K of T plus delta is approximately equal to one minus delta delta times K of T, right? So, um, yeah, so, so yeah, anytime you have this, this either like a Poisson or a proportional decay process that, that produces um, these sorts of exponentials, then you can, you can use this approximation, yeah. Um, Okay, so then, uh, so the so, so we need to we need to subtract kind of and divide things intelligently here. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to we have this one here, this one times the continuation value. We're going to move that over and divide by delta, and that that's going to cancel this and this. Okay, so we're going to get some derivative on the left hand side, and then sort of like flow value stuff on the right. Okay, so um, and now for the I, for this maximization. You know, implicitly what that defines is I of K, right? Your policy function. Okay, that's, um, so we're gonna drop the max and just treat, you know, call these I of K basically. Okay, uh, right, so then what is that gonna, so if we subtract, we're gonna get V of K. So we're subtracting this one times the continuation value. So we're gonna get V of the whole thing in here. Okay. That's equal to um, okay, and then uh, let's divide by delta because we know we're going to be able to. We're going to on the right hand side we're going to be left with just uh, delta for the remaining terms. Okay, so we're going to divide that through. So over here on the right we're left with your flow value minus rho times that continuation value. And I'm going to just go ahead and write this here. Okay. So we've subtracted that that one times the continuation value divided by delta, and we get this. Okay, so now <clears throat> on the right we've got something that doesn't blow up uh, when delta goes to zero, and in, in particular this is going to just turn into v of k. All right, and on the left we have something that will converge and it will turn into derivatives uh, over there. Okay, so if the first thing you can see is like, yeah, this this is really just k. You know that 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 sort of k prime basically is, you know, it's one minus delta delta K plus delta I. Um, really that's just, if you multiply it out, it's delta plus, sorry, K plus delta times I minus delta K, right? So, <clears throat> you know, you have this delta K times delta here and then you have I times delta and we can factor this out. Okay, which, which in, in essence is just K plus delta times K dot, right? So, so k dot right, is just i minus delta k, right? So then, um, and this is generally true for these discretized settings. You just take the derivative and, and multiply by delta, and that's how your state variable is changing. Okay, so yeah. Um, so what does that mean here? So 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 here, okay. What does that mean? Well, that means that like what's inside here is k plus delta times. Right, that's what's inside there. So when we take the derivative, we take this limit rather, and it turns into a derivative, we're gonna get kind of the derivative of v, v, pre, v prime or vk times how how fast this is changing, right? It's, it's basically the chain rule. We're gonna get that derivative plus whatever is attached to delta, okay? So we're gonna get i minus delta k, no, wrong delta, i minus that delta, k times, let's call it vk, v sub k. That's the derivative of v with respect to k. We could write v prime, but it, it's easier to write vk. All right, so we get that from the chain rule, and then we just pick up a vk because that's a derivative, okay? And then, uh, oh, I forgot. Okay, um, so do I have that in the... Let me just see one thing here. Um, Okay, yeah, so, so we're doing a stationary setting. If, if there were non-stationarity, which is to say like something in here depended explicitly on T, then you'd have K comma T and you'd have to include that. You'd, you'd basically just get a V dot over here too. We're gonna say there's no secular systematic trends happening elsewhere. We're just looking at an isolated system. Okay, so in that case, there's no explicit T dependence. Every Everything that changes over time happens because of a change in the state variable. Okay, so left-hand side, we get that. Right hand side, we get this, right? So I, yeah, I mean, maybe I should be writing I of K. 
it's an IFK. Uh, it's not critical, but why not? Um, okay, minus, now here we can just write rho V of K. This limit doesn't explode. We can just take delta to zero, it's fine. Okay, and then, uh, all right, and usually, you know, we'll, um, ooh. Yeah, so this would be a minus sign, sorry, because this is really backwards from what you would usually, like how you would usually define uh, derivative. You do derivative, you do V of K plus whatever minus V of K, but this is backwards, so you get a minus sign. Okay, so this, this has a minus there. Okay, so then if we rearrange this, then we're gonna get what? We'll get rho V of K is equal to U F of K minus I of K plus this thing here. Okay, so what this is saying is, okay, the rho v, the sort of discounted utility notion flow is equal to flow value, which, which is straightforward, plus however fast this state variable is changing, i of k minus delta k, times the derivative. Okay, so the derivative gets you like sort of the marginal effect of getting an additional uh, unit of k, and you just multiply that by the rate of change. So kind of intuitive um and usually like i'm gonna drop explicit k dependent so I'll, I'll write it more like this i'll keep it for like something like f of k but then i'll, I'll drop it for like i and uh, v so we we'll usually write it something like this okay and then i guess if we're, if we're doing explicit k dependence here then this would be okay all right so but but generally i'll i'll, I'll write something more like that Okay, and it's assumed that V is V of K and I is I of K and so on. All right, so so this is it. This is our this is our value function. Okay, that 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 is important, and that's going to get us most of what we need to to sort of think about solving this system. Okay, um, there's one other thing that's lurking around that we haven't 100% dealt with, which is the first order condition for I. Okay, so what actually determines our policy function I? Okay. So that we can do, all right, and we're going to do it. Um, there's two ways you could do it. One way is you can say, well, just just throw a max in here. There's still basically like we we kind of ignored the max, but essentially the max still exists here, and we can take a derivative and 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 find that out, and we'd get something that actually is correct. Uh, but but kind of the the more careful way to do it, which will give us the same answer, is to take derivative here, okay, and then take the limit. Okay, so you take the derivative first, then you take the limit. It turns out that taking the limit and then the derivative gives you the same answer, okay? But in general, it's not always safe to assume exchangeability of these these operations, okay? So um, let's do it Let's do it the careful way. So if we take a, a first order condition here, all right, for our uh, i, for i, then what are we going to get? We're going to get minus delta u prime f k minus i. So you get a, like a minus, this is a prime here and a u prime and the delta sticks around, all right? Plus one minus delta rho. So how is I gonna manifest itself here? So it's, it's inside V, okay, remember this parenthesis corresponds to this one. It's inside V, it has a delta attached to it. Okay, so we're gonna pick up a delta, which is actually good because we need to cancel the other one over here. Uh, we're gonna pick up a delta and we're gonna turn this into a V Remember, we're calling this VK, not V prime necessarily. Uh, and then um, inside, well, okay, inside we'll have we'll have the same thing, but we can, we can take care of that in a second. Okay, so that's what what that's going to look like. That's our FOC. This is this is you know del del i. Okay, and of course that should be equal to zero. Okay, so. Um, you guys can see all the way over. Good. Okay. So then, um, now all we do is take the limit. Okay. So first of all, we note that these deltas cancel. This cancel because it's equal to zero. These deltas are going to cancel. Okay. So then, and then we can move this minus over and get u prime f of k minus i is equal to one minus delta rho v sub k. 1 minus delta delta plus delta i. Okay, so that's if you cancel the deltas and turn it into an equality. This is a k here. Okay, that's step number one. Um, 
and then sub number two is just take the limit as delta goes to zero. That turns out to be quite, you know, fine to do because nothing blows up once we cancel those deltas. So this left hand side is the same. Okay, and then uh, the right hand side. Um, so this this thing just converges to one. This converges to just v of k. So then you just get v sub k of, of k. Right? I guess this is again. If we're writing k's explicitly, it would look like this, okay? If we're dropping k dependence whenever we can, then I'll write it like this. Okay, so this is like weirdly large gap between u prime and the parentheses. Okay, so this is this is our FOC. Let's see, not fog, FOC. Um, okay, so that's that's gonna be our equation. So what that's saying is that's, I mean, it's if effectively it's determining I in some sense. So it's like, okay, we have a certain marginal benefit of uh, getting more capital and we have to give up some consumption to do that. This is our marginal utility of consumption. Okay. Uh, and, you know, if, if you think about like, um, uh, let's see. Yeah. So if you think about, like let's say this was log utility this would be like one over f of k minus i right is equal to some number which encodes how useful capital is um so there you know as so i actually so imagine i is is zero okay so i can actually you can go negative when i goes negative you're 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 basically reverse investing you're you're pulling out capital and consuming it okay so it's like you know and Dr. Zhivago, when your Zhivago goes out and steals a, a fence to burn it, you know, you're, 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 you're taking capital and you're using it for consumption. Uh, usually a sign of hard times, but, um, you know, you can do it here in this model. It's reversible. That's an assumption. I mean, may, maybe it's not a good assumption, but it's an assumption here. So if, if I goes negative, right, then as I go to like minus infinity, okay, then this thing, consumption is going to go really high, okay? Uh, and this thing would be really low. Okay, it would go, it would go to zero if under reasonable and out of conditions. Um, and then, and then conversely, as i goes to f of k, right? Then consumption goes to zero, and this thing goes to infinity. So it, what I'm saying is, it's a monotone, uh, continuous monotone function that ranges from zero to infinity. And so it, you're always going to have some i that exactly hits this. Okay. Um, yeah. So so that's good. It's well defined. Right. Um, and it just relies on that assumption that you, you can do reverse investment and that, that gives you that, that you always have a solution. Now, if you, if you said you can't, you can't disinvest, uh, then you just hit a boundary. That's fine too. You, you'd say, okay, well, you know, this is actually really, these FOCs are always inequalities, right? Uh, in some sense. So you'd hit the boundary at I equals zero and say, that's, that's it. We're not going to invest. We're not going to do anything. Okay. So that's, that's also fine. It's just a, it's a, it's a little more complicated. All right. Um, <clears throat> And then the other thing you can do is here, this is linear technology, okay? Uh, this is linear investment technology. You can do different stuff. Remember a while back we did that, that where you had to produce, explicitly produce capital instead of just sort of one for wanting it at a consumption uh, and output. Um, you could do that here. You could have an investment cost function and stuff like that. That's pretty common here to, to kind of stabilize things if, if they get too wacky um, in, in a continuous time setting. So, uh, but but for now, let's just keep it keep it simple. All right. Okay. So these are our two equations, right? These, these two things here together define V and I basically. Okay. So they, they give us everything we need. Right. Um, and it, it should look familiar. It should look familiar to the to standard neoclassical growth model in discrete time. All right. Um, then the, the other thing is we still have an envelope condition. Okay. We can still do that. Uh, and nothing terrible happens. All right. Uh, so, so let's do that. Remember the envelope condition relies on the fact that when you take the derivative of a value function, you're going to pick up explicit K dependence always. Uh, you're also going to pick up policy function dependence here, but anytime you pick up that policy function dependence, you're about, you're effectively picking up an FOC, which is going to be equal to zero. Okay. And so you can, you can, you can treat it like this. I, but if you think about what the, the, I, if you took a derivative here row v sub k would be on the left the k derivative this is this is del del k okay you take a k derivative here you get row v k 
if you just look at the IA contribution, you're going to have a U prime of C minus U prime of C plus BK. Well, that's exactly this. And that's equal to zero. Like if you, you know, if you subtract, it's equal to zero. Okay. So you can see the same envelope logic says that you can ignore I dependence because you're maximizing over it. Okay. So then we do pick up, however, explicit K dependence through F of K. Here, so we're going to U prime of C and then F prime of K. Remember, th this inside here is C, but I'm writing it out. That's consumption. Uh, so you pick up the F prime of K here, all right? And then uh, now over here, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so you're going to get what? So let's do this derivative the first, I minus delta K times the derivative of the second, V K K. All right. Uh, plus the derivative of the first times the second. So the derivative of the first, remember I isn't going to show up here, but we are going to get a minus delta K times the second, which is VK. All right. Um, cool. All right. So that's nice. Um, let me think for a second. Yeah, I knew something was wrong. Derivative of the first is minus delta, not delta k. And then we get v k, right? OK, and we may as well just write that over here now that we have a v k. OK, so then this is. All right, so, so that's our function there. Um, if you want, you can move the delta over and combine it. You can see there's a common row plus delta, you know, reminiscent of, of you know, we, we often see row plus row and delta. They're friends, OK? They're together and friends. Um, and they're happy. Uh, okay, so we got u prime, f prime of k, and then this thing here. Note that this is i dot. This is the rate of change of, of capital also. Okay, so that's that'll be important in a second. Delta k and v k k. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, okay. So we got this. Is it good? Kind of. Yeah. Sure. It's our envelope condition. Um, it doesn't really simplify things. It just introduces another layer of derivatives, VKK, which we have no idea what that looks like. We know it's probably negative, but that's about it. Okay. Um, so it, it may it seem at first blush to be not super useful. Uh, the one thing you can do, though, is use this to, to figure out what's happening, particularly at steady state. Okay. So remember, at steady state, k dot equals zero. And there's no stochastic element here, by the way. So you just start at some k, and then you converge to steady state still. All right, so it's not like you're moving around like a lot. You're just starting somewhere and then eventually converging. OK, so at steady state, k dot is 0, and that means that this term's going to disappear because I, I minus delta k equals 0. So that's good. That'll actually simplify our, our, our lives a lot. So let's say we do steady state, meaning k dot equals 0, meaning I minus delta k equals 0. All right, suppose we're at such a place. So then we get rho plus delta v of k. Uh, you know, it's like k star, really, but like like this would be like k star, but I'm not going to write it. All right. And then uh, now, um, you know, state state also means that investment equals delta k. If this is zero. Investment perfectly counteracts uh, depreciation. Okay. So then if you want, you can plug in. Delta k here, okay, and then um, f prime of k, and then this thing is zero, okay. So that's actually it, okay. So we we get that, um, and then uh, okay. So then it's like, all right, well, that's that's pretty good. Um, is there anything else we can do? Turns out, yes, okay. Um, and that thing we can do is plug in the first order condition. That's that's this k star steady state, right? So if we do that, because because here we essentially like this stuff we kind of know. This there's known functions and parameters. The only thing we don't really know yet is k v of k, and so we plug that in. Okay, so then we get u prime f of k minus delta k on the left, and on the right actually we get the same thing. This is just this is just u prime of c should be said at steady state. OK, uh, prime k. All right, so in fact, this thing cancels. The, the marginal utility cancels, and we don't even need parentheses anymore. 
rho plus delta is equal to f prime k. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, remember, you know, f prime, maybe f prime of k is k to the alpha, or maybe that's alpha k to the alpha minus one. You could solve this for k. You know, maybe I should write, you know, k star. This is our steady state. It's an ugly star, but k star. That's our steady state um, capital. You know, it's some in in uh, Cobb Douglas land, it would be like alpha over delta plus rho to the one over one minus alpha, for instance. Okay, but it's in general, it's just delta plus rho equals f prime of k. So, so same, basically the same answer is what I'm saying. That's a good sign, um, as we usually get. Now, yeah, and so so from this, it's like so we know steady state capital. Okay, that's good. We kind of know where things are anchored. Um, and then we also have this value function, okay, uh, which we could up here, which we could solve for in, princ in principle. So this is like a differential equation. This is their derivative term. This is V, okay. And uh, we know uh, the first order condition, which will tell us what I is. Okay, so the whole, we kind of like know what's going on. And in terms of this, this differential equation here, our, um, you remember the think about the transversality condition kind of ensures we end up in steady state. The transversality condition is kind of like a boundary condition. Here, our boundary condition, we can just say, okay, we have this differential equation. Our boundary condition is that we know there's a steady state. And at that steady, steady state, which is k star, which we can solve for, we can calculate what v of k is. Okay, so basically the, the, the boundary condition is like, we kind of know what's happening at vk at a steady state. Because once you're in steady state, you stay there forever. Okay, and so you can calculate what's VK. You can calculate what is V itself by plugging in here. Okay, but and you know everything. You can calculate V itself at steady state without solving anything, and then that's your boundary condition. That's you know that V of a particular K is equal to a particular value, and then from there the differential equation will tell you the rest. Okay, so that's how it works here in in uh, value function land. Um. Okay, so that's that's and that's pretty much it. There's, there's really nothing more to say. Um, if you want to compute it, uh, you can. All right, and you you, you need to you need to be a little bit careful about how you calculate your derivatives in a discretized setting because you're when you compute stuff, you're always on a grid. In this kind of place, it's kind of a um, problem. You're always on a grid for k, and so you need to be careful. Basically, you need to you need to use that steady state boundary condition. Okay, so. Um, that's a little bit more advanced. I don't know if we're gonna have time to talk about the computational side for this sort of stuff, but that's that's doable. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. So uh, so what can we do with this? Well, we can add in stochastic elements, for instance. Okay. Um, I guess the other thing, yeah, John. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm not going to talk too much about computation. I'm I might have some stuff. I just have some slides lying around that have stuff about computation. So I'll just throw that in in case you want to check it out. You can reference it later at your leisure. Um, so I'll throw that in. Okay. Uh, it, it, yeah. It turns out you have to be a little bit careful. Okay. Blah blah blah. Let's go through my old slides here. Okay. But let's do. Um, Let's do a stochastic thing. All right, so I need to pull up some different notes here for stochastic processes. Okay, so this is um, generally it's called, you know, something like stochastic processes. Okay, so we're thinking about random processes kind of doing their thing over time. Uh, turns out like you could imagine, you know, if you think about a stochastic process, things can evolve randomly over time in many different ways, okay? Uh, but it turns out that if you, if you put a few, um, relatively mild assumptions, uh, on them, then there's one in particular, the, the, this Brownian motion or Wiener process that, that seems to be sort of, uh, much like the normal distribution kind of important. Okay. Um, and it, you'll see it's analogous to a normal distribution for stochastic processes, basically. And it's based on a normal distribution. Okay. It's essentially the central limit theorem sort of thing. Okay. So, um, so, but you know, if you think about other stochastic processes, like we talked about, we've talked about some already, the Poisson process is 
a stochastic process. Um, it evolves over time. It's a little bit weird because it it um, it's a discrete sort of thing where it, it, the outcomes are discrete. Okay, so you get it. It happens once, and then nothing happens for a while, and then boom, it happens again, and nothing happens for a while. So the the Poisson process is more of like a count process. So it's like how many you know customers coming into your store. That's a that could be a Poisson process. Okay, or um, uh, people getting on a bus or something like these sort of queuing things like that's sort of sort of what we think about when we think of Poisson processes. Um, we, we're looking for is now we're going to do something a little bit more continuous. Okay, where it's more like think about a financial time series happening at very high granularity down to like the middle of the second or whatever, uh, and it's moving around over time. Okay, um, so uh, we can do that. Um, and so, so what I guess what I'm going to say is, is I'm going to give you some conditions, okay? And then it'll turn out that there's like a class of, of stochastic processes that that satisfy these conditions, okay? So first, let's do some some notation and stuff like that. All right. Uh, okay. So this is stochastic processes. Processes? I don't know. Stochastic processes. Right, um, so these are basically random functions. They're random functions. We're going to start at time zero, go off to infinity, and what the function looks like is random. Okay, and so we can we can address the function at particular points in time, but what it'll be at that time is random, and there might be correlation. Generally, there will be correlation uh, between the function value at different times. Okay. But the whole thing is random. Okay. Um, and so you can think about addressing at particular times. You can also think about looking at it conditionally, conditionally on a certain evolution, what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So uh, let's call, we're going to call our, our uh, process W. Okay. So the, the, this Wiener process, which I'll talk about in a second is important. And I, I assume that's why they call it W. Okay. Uh, so this this is our you know like W of T. So here, um, I guess I could write of T. Let me think. Yeah. So usually people write sub T for some reason, but it, I don't know. It, it kind of irks me. So let's write of T. Okay. So this is going to be some process. So but but again, it's a, it's a random outcome. So it's not a number. It's a random outcome. Random variable. All right. Uh, so that's going to be our, our process. Doesn't have to be a Wiener process, but it, it may be. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to give you some conditions. Okay. So let's say, let's, th these aren't always true. These are things that I'm going to say, like, what if we wanted to construct something that uh, looked like this? Okay. Um, that had, that satisfied these conditions. Okay. So then one condition, and, and these are going to look, similar to those conditions for Poisson processes too. So let's say one condition we, we want to look at is the the change in the value of the process from some time S to some time T. Okay. So, uh, or actually, no, sorry. Well, in my notes, I'm going to write it like T is the initial value and S is the future value. So let's do this. S here. No, I just wrote the same thing that I wrote again. The true final form here will be S here and then T. So we're, we're like start base value is T and then in the future there's some S. Okay, so we're gonna write it like this and we're gonna kind of write this notation of like conditional on everything that happened up to time T. Okay, conditional on zero to T, what happens between T and S in the future, okay? Um, so that could be a lot of things, all right? We're gonna say it's gonna be normal, okay? With mean zero, okay. So this is like a uh, has some. It looks like a random walk or a martingale. If you if you've seen that sort of thing, it's the expectation is that it won't move. Obviously, it will move somewhere, but the expectation is that on average, it won't it won't move around. Okay, um, like that. And then the variance is s minus t. Okay, so this is there's a couple of different things packed into here. Okay, so one is this is true for all t and s. Okay. So you, you just some amount of time elapses, and then you look to the future again between T and S. What's the change going to be? So you're you're at a certain date and time. 
stock price is a certain value and you're wondering how much is it going to change between today and next week. What we're saying is that <clears throat> whatever the S and T may be, uh, that's going to be normal. Okay. It's going to have mean zero. The expectation is going to be zero. Uh, and it's going to have with this linear variance. So the, the, the longer the amount of time you consider the, the variance, not the standard deviation, but the variance goes up linearly. Okay. No, and so that's going to mean in particular that the this, this standard deviation, though, is is quite is quadratic, not quadratic. It's a square root. Okay, so the the, the variance goes up linearly, but the standard deviation uh, is is uh, a square root. Okay, so that that's that'll be important later on. Okay, um, so this has a couple of properties. So we know we know that remember with Poisson processes, I alluded to the concept of being levy stable, right? Which means that if you take two variables that are Poisson variables, random variables, and you add them together, they're also, that sum is a Poisson variable, okay? That's that's a stability in the sense that when you add these two variables, they, they stay in that same class, okay? That's not always true, okay? So um, if you take, uh, well, actually, it's, you know, the, the, it's it's often true for, for we, we end up considering types of random variables for which that is often true. If you take something that's like, a beta distribution, which is bounded between zero and one, and look at the sum of those two, that's not going to be a beta distribution, if only because it's potentially going to be larger than one. Okay, so um, there are definitely types of distributions that are not levy stable, but a lot of the stuff like exponential, Poisson, normal, that we consider are levy stable in that sense. Okay, so um, normal is levy stable is what I'm saying. And so this has the property, which is almost necessary, which is you know, if you consider from T to S, one and then from s1 to s2 each of those segments i have a pen here i can use it um so consider from t to s and then let's say we had s1 and s2 okay so this here is gonna have variance s1 minus t okay and then this here is gonna have variance s2 minus s1 and so then the whole thing should have variance s2 minus t and in fact if we just redefine as if we define if we apply this for t and s2 it will okay so the the fact that the normal distribution is levy stable that it allows for this additively to be consistent whatever we throw at it okay if if normal if this whatever distribution we had here wasn't levy stable and i could do this whole logic and it would it would find a contradiction okay so this like this sort of implies levy stability it requires levy stability of whatever this is, which is the normal distribution. Okay. So um, that's one thing. All right. So this is called um, normal and independent increments. Okay. Um, that's number one. Number So number one, actually number one is really the most important part. Okay. Uh, so remember Poisson had independent increments. Okay. The, the change was, was independent across time. Okay. Uh, but its increments were distributed according to the, uh, the Poisson distribution, which is like a discrete distribution, okay? Um, but it's also one that's levy stable, okay? So uh, that that's one thing. So now how do, if we just have one, then we're not, if you think about this as a characterization, um, kind of like, you know, like rowy stuff, you know, if you, you have these conditions on utility, does it characterize expected utility, whatever. Um, here we're saying you put these conditions on stochastic processes. What does it allow for us to, to entertain? Okay. Um, okay. So right, right now, if we just had one, it could, it could be a Wiener process, which is what we'll see, which is like a, just a random walk to the Brownian motion sort of thing. Um, which should look, it, it looks like a lot like financial time series basically. Uh, and then, um, Number, so if we just had that, we could have Wiener process or we could have a Poisson process or we could have some other stuff too. Okay. So, um, Number one doesn't constrain us kind of that much or like enough for our purposes. Okay. So we need another condition. Okay. So this is, this is, let me give you the name. So this is independent increments. Okay. And then we need continuity because the Poisson process is not continuous. It jumps discontinuously over time. So we're going to impose continuity. All right. Um, so we're going to say the limit as h goes to zero. Let me make sure I get this right. Uh, yeah, of the probability 
that w of t plus h. So this increment here over a probably a small uh, time step h. I guess I could have written delta, but this is how they write it in the, the book that I'm looking at. Um, the absolute value of the increment over some small time step h. Probability that that's less than, sorry, that it's greater than epsilon. I guess we could do it either way, but let's do it. The probability that we have sort of a, a large-ish increment, okay, is equal to zero for any epsilon, for any h. No, sorry, h goes to zero for any epsilon and any t, okay. Um, so this is this is continuity with probability one, basically, okay. Um, yeah, so Poisson definitely does not satisfy that um, because it'll jump. Um, other things do not satisfy that. So, so in particular, uh, let's see, we could, like, let's say we put in another distribution here. So like we could put in the Poisson distribution here that would violate number two. If we put in, um, is it Lorenz? A Lorenz distribution, which is like, it's a single peak kind of funky looking kind of asymmetric distribution that they use sometimes, I think, in physics. If we threw one of those in here, um, it, it wouldn't have this continuity property because its its tails are too heavy. Okay, so normal distribution has thin tails. It decays at e to the minus x squared. It decays rapidly uh, in the tails. And that... Uh, that ensures continuity basically. Okay. So whereas if you used um, uh, other potentially dis distributions without thin tails that had heavy tails, you might get discontinuities essentially. Okay. Um, so in some sense, these are, these are redundant, right? I guess, I guess really what I should have said is like, there's some levy stable distribution here and it should be stable. And then that means it has to be normal, but it's normal. Okay. So, uh, we're just going to assume it basically. Okay. So these are sort of conditions, but they're also sort of just things that are true. Okay. So that it's not, it's not a super clean characterization, um, but it'll do. Uh, okay. So, but the, the, we don't have to worry about proving anything here. All right. We're just talking about stuff and taking results that are out there and, and using them. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, that, no, the distribution I was thinking of the Cauchy distribution. Okay. So, um, all right, so 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 how can we? This is all very abstract, at least for me. How can we think about this in a more practical sense? Uh, so let let's do what we always do and and start thinking about things in uh, discrete time steps delta. Okay, and we can use these conditions. Okay, in particular condition number one, independent increments. Okay, so independent increments says that when we go from t to t plus delta, it should have some distribution like this. And it should be normal zero delta here. Okay, so uh, W of t plus delta minus W of t, uh, well, not equal to, it should be distributed like normal zero delta, right? Okay, so then. Um, Good. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that we can write this as W of T plus Delta minus W of T is equal to some Z. So basically, or so think about Z as a, a random normal, but as a unit normal. Okay. So we can write it like this square root of Delta times Z where Z is distributed normal zero one. So Z, Z, this is a Z, not whatever I wrote there. Z is a standard normal has mean zero and unit variance okay you, you amp that up by a factor of this, the our desired standard deviation square root of delta that turns it into a, a normal zero delta remember when you multiply this you, it, that's the standard deviation the variance will go up by the, the square of that okay which is delta okay so we can think about these increments as you just take normals multiple standard normals multiply them by the square root of the time step and that's what you get all right um Okay, so 
uh, what does that get us? All right. So, so now you can think about, you could think about like simulating such a time series. Okay. You start it, you know, we're, we're always going to assume I didn't write this, but we're, we're always going to assume that W zero is just like by con convention is equal to zero. You start at zero and then stuff happens. It's without loss of generality. Okay. So, um, we can use this, okay, to kind of, you can, you can effectively simulate stuff. So like, if you want to think about W of T, what's W of T? Well, it's W of zero plus, um, you can write it as like a sum of, of, of each increment between zero and T. Okay. So let's say that there were N increments. Okay. So from I equals, uh, one, I guess, to N, yeah, uh, of, It should be like let me let me write it and then I'll decide if it's right. Yeah, so it's like you you, ha you break it into n. You know, you're going from zero to t. And you break it into these n increments of size delta. Okay, and so then you're just this is just summing over each of those increments. Okay. Um, okay. And so this is, you know, the, and this is, this is just Delta I plus Delta. Okay. So we're just, we're just discretizing things and summing over each of those increments. Okay. So then using what you know, so this is zero that drops out. Okay. This is a sum I equals one to N. Okay. And, and this, this is effectively just a bunch of these increments. Okay, so it's a sum of like square root of delta times some zi. And the zi's again are all these z the zi's are separate independent standard normals. Okay. All right, so then And we know that, uh, you know, if, if you sort of go the other direction and say, okay, well, if, if these, each ZI has variance one, then each delta, square root of delta ZI has variance delta, okay? Then this whole sum has variance N times delta, and, and really in this discretization scheme, N times delta is equal to T, right? Each, when you add all this up, it has to be that that total time elapsed is equal to the number of time steps times the size of each time step. Okay. So then this thing still has variance uh, T, which is exactly what this requires, right? W of T minus W zero should have variance T. Okay. So um, it all kind of hangs together. And, this, and, and I guess what I'm saying here is that you can think about this as the limit of this process. You take, you, you break it into a bunch of time steps. You draw a little zi for each of these. You scale it up by the square root of that size of that time step, and you sum all together. That should look like a Wiener process, or it, it you know it should look like something that satisfies these properties. Okay, and then you take the limit as delta goes to zero. Okay, and that's going to give you. Uh, so so basically, as as delta goes to zero. That gives you this Wiener process. So really, you know, all all the Wiener process is is well. First of all, it satisfies these conditions, okay? And it's just you take a bunch of normals and you add them up. It's like a red. It's like a random walk with normal increments, okay? And you just add them up, right? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, okay? And that's so you can you can simulate it like that. All right now, what if we? This is for the Wiener process, okay? Which has, which is nice. It has good properties. It's friendly, um, and it's continuous and everything like that. Okay. So the other thing we can do is ask, okay, well, what if ZI is not normal in the sense of Gaussian normal? Okay. Um, not Gaussian. Okay. Uh, what if it's not Gaussian? So then you, 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 this stuff, 
is still true if we, if we have independent increments, right? Independent increments allows us to write this here. Okay. But what if we, we what if we drew zi from something that wasn't a standard normal? Okay. Um, in that case, you might get some weird stuff. You might get things that are not continuous. Okay. Uh, and so on. So like you can, um, the, so the Cauchy distribution is sort of the prime example. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, so, so, so let's think, so we could, we could do, um, Yeah, so we, we could do Cauchy. And I'll show I'll show you a graph of that actually in a second. Okay. So Cauchy is um do I have the I don't have the, the Cauchy is is it's weird looking, but it has a as a simple PDF. Okay, which I can tell you in a second. I forgot what it is exactly. It's it's like one over one plus x squared. Um but the, there's an extra factor. You need like a pi in there. Okay, so so the Cauchy the Cauchy distribution like f of x or f of, I guess f of z we should say here uh is like one over pi times one over one plus x squared z squared okay so as as z goes to plus or minus infinity it goes to zero it's kind of single peaked except it's asymmetric kind of uh or no, it, should, it should be symmetric but it's 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 it looks different from a normal because it's kind of thinner um and then one over pi is just you that ensures that it integrates to one. Okay, it turns out if you integrate this, you get like an arc secant or something. Okay, so um, so that's that's what that looks like. It's you know something like that, except symmetric and not funky. All right, so um, you could do that. Okay, uh, but but then you have this issue that it may it kind of may have heavy tails. Okay, so um, or heavier than the normal distribution. Okay, uh, and that induces some discontinuity. Okay, so it's not it's not obvious to see at all. Okay, but um, it's 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 a it, it's a heavy tails thing. So let me show you an actual plot. Okay, so we head over here to these slides. I'll put these slides up tonight. Okay, um, so so what happens if we do that thing? We take these we take these individual zi's, however they're distributed, we scale them up by square root of delta, and then we sum those all together. Okay, what happens if we do that? So on the left is the Wiener process when these actually are normal. Okay, um, and you can see it's you know it's this kind of fuzzy looking, uh, random walk ish financial. Th if you look at a stock series, they always look like this. They all look the same in my opinion, uh, and they just go around like this. Okay, um, and they move. They're 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 random walky, so they they do big movements and they're very persistent. In, in the level the, the the increments of course are independent but the, the level ends up being very persistent because it's a random walk okay um so you can you can show all sorts of stuff about this you know it's it's a okay so first of all it's a martingale it has expect the, the expectation that changes zero it's highly persistent uh there's this thing called dube single crossing lemma which is that for any finite threshold it will eventually cross that regardless of if the fact that it's at it's currently at positive 1 billion it'll eventually cross minus a trillion given enough time okay so it, it moves around a lot okay um so you can show all sorts of stuff about that the other thing you can show is that it, this this relates to this this fractal nature of things um if you zoom in because it's a continuous limit if you zoom in on this it always looks kind of the same it's not going to look exactly like this but it'll always have the same kind of like appearance. Okay. That's like a fractal uh, property. As you zoom in, the structure doesn't change on average. Okay. Uh, I think like Mandelbrot somehow is still alive and came to Pitt to give a talk like two years ago. I think David, David Agarastos went to see it uh, in Jordan. Um, so you can ask them about that. So it, 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 it relate, you know, he does like financial stuff. So it kind of relates to that. Um, so that's your Wiener process. So now for us, we can think about like, you know, maybe you have a neoclassical growth model where the uh, uh, the productivity Z uh, is moving around according to a Wiener process. Okay. And we can think about that and we can evaluate that as part of a value function. Okay. But we need to be careful about how to incorporate this stochastic element. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, that's the Wiener process. The other thing you can do is uh, 
use something other than a normal distribution. And in particular, you could use the Cauchy <clears throat> distribution uh, here. So now this looks very different. Uh, it's not as fuzzy and it definitely jumps here, here. You can see these jumps. No matter how far you get, no matter how small you make delta, these jumps always happen, okay? Uh, and it's because the Cauchy distribution doesn't have those thin tails and essentially the central limit theorem breaks down, okay? Sometimes this is called the Levy flight, okay? Any anything, anything like this, sometimes it's called the Levy flight, but sometimes uh, in particular ones that break down and are still discontinuous in the limit <clears throat> uh, are called Levy flights, okay? So now a couple things. First of all, it's clear also though that the, there's a finite number of discontinuities over a finite interval, okay? So so the set of points where it's discontinuous is still measure zero, but there's still like, you know, five to 10 discontinuities going on here, okay? So that's one thing, um, and they're big. Uh, and, but but other stuff, I mean, it's still, a, it's still a random walk, it still has expectational change of zero and single crossing and lemma, dupe single crossing lemma, all that stuff. So it has some of the same properties, but visually you can see very different, it has that, those discontinuities, okay? Um, and you can go through, uh, and, and basically use like sort of central limit theorem style stuff, characteristic functions of distributions and show that in the case, uh, of a, of a thin tail distribution, that it's always going to be a vita process. So, so that this is actually a generalization saying, okay, what if it was, what if our generating process was not normal, but something reasonable? Okay. Um, what then? Well, then you'd still get it. You'd still get it turning into a Wiener process, which looks normal-ish uh, in the limit because of the central limit theorem, because you're adding together a bunch of distributions that are thin-tailed. Central limit theorem says those will look kind of normal-like. Okay, so you don't have to start with a normal. I did, but you don't have to. It could just be any thin-tailed distribution, and the central limit theorem will get you the rest of the way. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's sort of, okay, so I really only got through the stochastic process part um but you can so we'll talk about sort of the central limit theorem component i'm gonna i'm just flying through the slides here we'll talk about the central limit theorem component and then eventually we're going to get to how to incorporate those into to value functions okay so we're out of time for today um but yeah so you know uh best of luck on the homework um and if you if you have any questions now let me know uh, or if anything comes up, shoot me an email. I'll be teaching a lot today, but I'll at least be around tonight. Um, so hopefully I can, I can respond. Uh, otherwise submit those babies on blackboard. Just go to the, the, go to the assignment, click on the assignment itself. And there's, there's going to be like an upload button there. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got for today. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, see you all next week, which, uh, which is our last week of class. Yeah. So we're running out of time. We only have two classes left. I believe. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Um, nah, I mean, wait, mm. no, I don't think we will. It's, it's not, yeah. I mean, it's not that different from expanding varieties, but I'll probably just stick to expanding. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to really put lab equipment in the final. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean like so the question is like yeah i mean i think you know I, there's always a, there's always a neighborhood around what we do that's fair game right in terms of models the question is is lab equipment in that neighborhood of uh of what we did for expanding varieties um because the end of the day lab equipment is just like you get you take some labor, you combine it with these these intermediates. The difference is like for lab equipment, you're using a uh, final good to produce the intermediates rather than the labor. That's actually the biggest difference is that the way that you're piping things through the production system, you're using final good to make the intermediates. So it's kind of recursive. Um, but then the, the 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 structure of the solution is like you know demand function, pricing rule, profits, value, free entry. All that's pretty similar, okay? And then also for the the research, you might use final good as well. So it's really just like, are you using labor to produce the goods? Are you using labor to produce research? Are you using final good to produce the goods? Are you using final good to produce research? So like, 
that that's in the neighborhood ish of of expanding varieties. Okay, so I'm not going to say it's you're not going to see lab equipment model. What I will say is like it's not something that's like that's not like like think think about like what you need to study is there's there's points and then there's neighborhoods around those points. Our points are like expanding varieties, creative destruction, and like whatever we do like next class maybe a little bit on stochastic stuff, value functions basically. There's neighborhoods around those points. Worry about that stuff, but don't worry about stuff that's in the neighborhood of a thing that's in the neighborhood. Okay, so like go first order, but don't go second order. Okay, and I would say that lab equipment's kind of like that's it's kind of in the neighborhood of of potentially expanding varieties. Okay, that's what I'll say. But I'm not. I I can't commit to not putting something that may look like lab equipment. Okay, and maybe change up like do you use final good or do you use labor for production or something like that. Okay, so that's what I'll say. Sound good? The final, so it's like, don't worry, don't, don't like, I mean, you use, I mean, look at lab equipment and, and it, you, you can see, uh, how how things change when you use final good instead of labor to 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 do intermediate production okay so that that gives you an idea of like a variation a pretty big one but a variation that you could put on one of these models okay use i mean maybe look at that as as like just to try and understand things and just practice going through like a variant of the model okay so think about it more as as like a variant of, of expanding varieties Okay, just like when we did when we did scale effects on the homework, it's like you're you're the very what you're changing is the research production function to include this n to the phi term. Okay, to to think about lab equipment is another variant, but don't think about it as like a core point that defines the neighborhood of stuff that you you should be studying, basically. Pardon. Um. I mean, you don't have to like there's there's you know, there's other models out there that are also in the neighborhood of expanding varieties that could be on the exam. Uh, and you could look at those. I mean, they exist somewhere in the world on the Internet. Right. So it is true that lab equipment is in the notes. OK, but I would look at that more as just like practice. So um yeah, so but it, it, there's definitely no guarantee. It's not like lab equipment will for sure. Like expanding varieties or creative destruction will almost certainly be on the final, right? That's like, you should definitely know that, okay? Just go, I would look at lab equipment as as practice. Here's a variant that you can, of a model but that, that you could uh, make. And there will be some variant of either the uh, creative destruction or expanding varieties model on the final. And you should sort of like, be ready for it. Right. So looking at lab equipment, definitely helpful using it as practice, but there's, there's definitely, you know, like it's not guaranteed to be on the final in the way that, that the core models are guaranteed to be guaranteed to be on the final. That's, yeah, that's what I'll say. Okay, anything else? All right, cool. Um, then, yeah, so I'll see, yeah, I'll see you guys next week and uh, have a good weekend. All right, bye-bye.
ideas, like, being potentially trans and this kind of thing, and that's why I think it is something to think about and that I think needs to develop. I mean, I think that could be a completely different example because that could be a parent situation. The problem is that uh, they're acting on so differently than the parent situation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.